Hello and welcome to my channel. Today's video is on user authentication using the Deoxys full stack framework. And this video is going to be split into a two part series where in part one, we'll take a look at classic authentication using an email address and a password. And in part two, we'll take a look at social authentication using Google. Now, the reason for this split is because the social authentication using Google is a little bit more involved and it requires us to drill down into the axiom layer of Deoxys. And so to keep the video simple, it's just easier to have it as a two part series. OK, so I'm going to start by creating a Deoxys full stack application and it needs to be full stack because we need to write some server side functions. And now we're going to add two dependencies to our project. We're going to add Rust Lite so that we can store the user's data in an SQLite database and Argon2 to hash the user's password. Now, before we move on to the code, let me take a moment to explain to you how a Deoxys full stack application works, just in case you weren't aware of it. When we compile a Deoxys full stack application, Deoxys will generate two different applications, one for the server and one for the client. Now, when we write our code, we're writing it as part of one project, but Deoxys needs to know what part of our code refers to the client application and what part of the code refers to the server application. Now, to get this to work in the code, we need to use conditional compilation using the CFG or the server attributes. And these attributes will allow code to be compiled and targeted for the two different applications that's going to be generated. So likewise, when we add a dependency to our project, we need to ensure that it gets compiled for the correct application. That is either the server or the client or even both. So here in our cargo file, you can see that we have a dependency on Argon2. And Argon2 is going to be used to hash the user's password. But you can also see that it's marked as optional. Now, because it's marked as optional, it won't get compiled unless we specifically add it as a dependency. So in this case, I'm adding it as a dependency to the server. And so now when we compile the code, Argon2 will only get compiled for the server. OK, so now that we know how to add dependencies, let's move on to the code. So here in the main Deoxys file, I have defined a component called main. And the main component will render a register and a login form. And this component has several states to manage user data as well as user interaction. Now in this video, our focus is going to be on the register and the login process, not so much on how to manage state or how to write components. But if you're new to Dioxys and you're not sure how to manage state or write components, then take a look at my channel. Hopefully some of my previous videos will help you get started. Now this component is fairly long, so we'll revisit it as and when we need to. For now, let's go ahead and compile the code and see what the component looks like. So here is a component. It's a fairly standard layout with a register and a login form. And there's a link to toggle between the two different views and that's managed by a state in the component. And notice that we have a sign in with Google button. That's just there as a placeholder for now, but we'll implement that in the next video. OK, so now let's get into some code. We need to write two server side functions, a register and a login function. We'll start with the register function first because we'll need a user to log in with later. And this function needs to be asynchronous and annotated with a server attribute. And it will take four arguments, first name, last name, email and a password. And all of these arguments are of type string. The function also returns a string. Now, normally we would return a JSON object with some meaningful data. But in this example, we'll just go ahead and return a message back to the user. Now, the data for these arguments is going to come from the client in the form of a post request. So all we have to do is take the data and save it into a database. In this example, we'll use SQLite and create a table called users. And once the database has been created, we can go ahead and delete this code because we don't want this code being executed every time the register function gets called. Now let's take a look at the users table. It contains columns that you would expect to find in any table that holds information about users. But it also contains a field called provider. And we're going to use this field to identify where the user's registration details came from. And this is because when a user signs in using Google, Google will provide the basic profile details for that user. And so we can take that data and store it into the users table. So potentially we could have a user who's registered on the website as well as signed in with Google. And this would mean that they would have two different user accounts, possibly using the same email address. And so by using the provider field, we can identify the user and sign them into the correct account. So I hope that was clear. Now let's move on to what we need to do next. So when a user registers on the website, we should check that their account doesn't already exist. We can do that easily by querying the user's table with a provided email address. But notice that I'm also using the provider field as a condition. Later in the code, we're going to set the provider to classic. And this is to identify that the user created the account on the website. OK, so the query row function will return a result. And if there's no matching records, the result will be of an error type. So we can use a match expression to create the user when there's an error. Now in production code, we would want to be more specific about what that error is before we go ahead and create the user. Now we all know it's not a great idea to store plain text parsers into a database table. And so for that reason, we need to hash the user's password just before we save it. And to do that, we're going to use the argon2 create. So let's import some types and then generate a salt that we can use to hash the user's password with. So on line 196, we generate a salt and we pass that salt as a reference to the hash password function along with the user's password. Now there's no need to store the salt separately. The password hash contains the salt. Let's go ahead and print it to see what it looks like. So on screen is a sample password hash and it includes the salt. So we can take this hash as it is and use it as the user's password. So all we have to do now is create the user into the database and return a message indicating that the account was created. 
Now take note of the provider here. I'm setting it as classic to indicate that the user has registered on the website. Okay, so now the register function is complete. So let's go ahead and call it from the client code. So here is the on-click event for the main primary button. And this button is used to register a user as well as sign the user in. And this is done using a state variable where the variable is set to false if the user is trying to register and true if the user is trying to sign in. So in the if statement, we can call the register function and provide it with all the arguments that it needs. And in this case, the arguments are going to come from the state variables. Now the register function returns a string, which is essentially a message indicating if the account already exists or if the account has been created. So we can take this message and display it in the component to give feedback to the user. And so now the registration process is complete. Let's go ahead and compile the code and enter our first user. So John Smith will be our very first user and we'll use a very secure password, password123, to create this account. So now John's account has been created and let's hope that there isn't a John out there somewhere in the world with that email address, otherwise I think he might be pretty mad at me. But moving on, whilst we're here, let's verify that we can't create an account using the same email address. So here you can see that the account already exists after clicking on the create account button again. And that's perfect, that's what we want. So now with our register function complete, let's go ahead and call the login function to get the user logged in. So once again, we create an asynchronous function called login. And this function will take two arguments, an email and a password, and it will return a string. And then using the email, we need to query the user's table for a user with that email address. Now notice in the query I'm using the provider as a condition. This is to ensure that we only query for users who have registered on the website. In the next video, when we look at social authentication using Google, we'll use the same query but set the provider to be Google. Okay, so this query will return a result and we can check this result to determine if the user exists. If it does, we can proceed to the next step, which is to verify the password that the user has entered against the password hash that's been stored against the user. So once again, we're going to use argon2, but before we verify the password, we need to take the password hash that's stored against the user and create a password hash type from it. So here in the code, the user variable is a tuple and index3 is referring to the password hash that's stored as a string. So essentially, we need to convert this password hash string into a password hash type. So now we can verify the password that's been entered by the user against the hash using the verify password function. And this function will return a result, so we can check the result to see if it's okay. If it is, we know that the login was successful. So that's it for the login function. Now all we have to do is call this function from the main component. So here in the else block, we call the login function with the email and password state fields. And just like the register function, we take the response and add it to the component to give feedback to the user. Now to test the login process, we'll use an invalid password. So what we expect to see is an unsuccessful login message. And now let's use the correct password and this should log us in successfully. So to summarize, in this video we looked at how to register and sign a user in. In the next video we'll take a look at how to implement the sign in with Google button. In the meantime, check out my channel for other Dioxus related videos. And if you like this video, please consider giving it a like and I'll see you all on the next video.